Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 386, uh, featuring the third, and I'm sad to say, final installment of my interview with the wonderful Mark Lewis Baldwin. In this part of the interview, we talk about some of his later games, including The Perfect General and Empire 2. Uh, he also talks about some uh, sort of coding conundrums he worked himself into and how he got out of those. Uh, we also talk about trains, a historic, in a historic train wreck uh, that Mark was able to find. So, quite a lot of cool stuff in this episode. So, without further ado, here is Mr. Mark Baldwin. All right. So, tell me about the the perfect general, you know, and how this game, how you wanted to sort of set this one apart from the Empire series. Well, um, there was an individual, Bruce, Bruce Sacanino that wanted to start a game publishing company. And he said he wanted a tactical combat game. He had some ideas for a tactical combat game. And he contact, contacted us to basically create a uh, perfect general. Um, so I designed the game. Uh, I used some of his ideas, but basically uh, designed the game pretty much from scratch. And then we implemented the design for uh, QQP, Quantum Quality Productions. Um, Quantum Quality Productions was the publishing company that um, published Perfect General. It was f formed by Zach and Eno. When it was first formed, I actually think I was vice president of development for the company for a short time. Uh, I decided, Bob and I decided, that we wanted to keep a little bit more arm's length from Zach and Eno. So I resigned probably after two or three months. So I really never did much for QQP. Um, and we just basically set it up as a development company, publishing company relationship. So what would you say were the key differences? Or what did you want to do? I assume you wanted to make something different than, than Empire. I mean, what was the main thing that you wanted to do differently with this game? Well, I was looking for a tactical game. Uh, Empire Strategic. Um, so I wanted. So for some, those that might not appreciate the difference, <laughs> and uh, define the difference is sometimes hard. Uh, strategic means you're looking at a large scale. Uh, your decisions are large scale in nature. And a big picture Tactical, stuff. Pardon? Big picture stuff. Big picture stuff. Tactical means you're making much smaller scale decisions. Like, I'm going to shoot my tank at this tank or this infantry division or whatever. Instead of, I'm going to take a mass of forces and come around this flank or whatever. That's moving more into the strategic space. So I wanted to play with things like lines of sight, individual or feeling for individual squads or tanks or whatever. So that's the game space I wanted to play with. Um, you could see some of my board game influence in that this game now used hexes instead of squares. I never really liked the squares for uh, Empire, although I tried to account for that by making movement in the diagonal direction cost more than movement in the horizontal and vertical direction. It still never felt quite as comfortable as the hex system. So I wanted to use the hex system. I wanted to use lines of sight and that kind of stuff. Obviously, you were successful. This was a pretty well, pretty good selling game, right? Not that Empire was, was shabby by any means. But, uh, you know, it seemed like everybody I know from that era had, has played this one. That was, uh, I really enjoyed working on it. Um, one little story I have about developing the game was I was running into what is known the, as the pathing problem. This was early on when people were not really running into pathing problems yet because games didn't have pathing problem issues. Pathing problem is how do you calculate the fastest way to go from location A to location B? Uh, especially if you it have... It seems straightforward, types. but I'm guessing there's a lot more technical <laughs> well, as humans, problems with it. Well, it's fairly easy. You have pattern recognition with humans. You look at the board, oh, I know, I just go around the trees and so on. Computers can't do pattern recognition well. They have to do grunt work. So 
I mean, at the most basic level, it tries out every single path possible and finds out which is the shortest path or the fastest path or whatever. Uh, but I was running into problems with this. Mainly, I mean, if I, a human is saying I want to go from A to B, if I took a half second for the computer to figure out how to do it, that's not a problem. But when I was working on the artificial intelligence, with the artificial intelligence, I was having to have the AI check all sorts of possible different moves and so on. And each time it wanted to try a different move, it would have to figure do the, solve the panning problem and so on. And I was taking way too long to make my artificial intelligent decisions. And 95% of that time was basically solving the panning problem. Okay, back in the 90s, we didn't have the internet. Or we, for all practical purposes, we didn't have the internet. I did not have access to artificial intelligence theory or uh, books like Knuth and so on. Knuth existed, I just didn't have his books. And so I was trying to so solve this problem on my own. It had been solved previously in computer science. Right. It had drifted into the computer game industry. I don't I think I might have been the first person to use this solution. But there is a well-known solution to the problem. It's called A star. I but I had never heard of A star. A star. Yeah. Um it's uh another solution to the problem is called Dijkstra. A star is a basically taking Dijkstra and taking it one better. It's algorithm. These days, any computer science class in data structures and so on, they'll t when they start talking about graphs, they'll start talking about Dijkstra and A star. Um, this is how Google solves what's the shortest path from your house to Fred's place or whatever. It uses A star to solve this. But again, I didn't know about it. And I can remember going to like, I think it was the third computer game developers conference. And I had been chewing on this problem in my mind and chewing on it and chewing on it and chewing on it. And I was sitting around the hotel waiting for a van to pick me up, to take me back to the airport. And I had an aha moment. The whole way to do this clicked suddenly in my mind. And I was jotting down notes on how to do it and so on. And I got home and I coded it all night and it worked beautifully. What was taking minutes to solve my AI was now taking seconds. And only after the fact, years after the fact, did I discover that solution was a star that had been solved years prior. Uh. So I can so here's a story where I ran into a problem early on in the game industry that I don't think people had run into before in games anyway. Obviously it had been run into for, before in other computer science problems. And I ind independently invented that algorithm, which I think is kind of cool. Yeah. Shame I didn't in, in, invent it before people like Caduce <laughs> or whatever, but <laughs> That's a good app. What do they call that and history class that simultaneous invention or something like that you know i talk to some people and they they say well you must have got it from you know it was out before so you must have seen something about it uh as i think it like you say classic example you had no knowledge of that whatsoever and just and you didn't have you created it on your own that you have now i mean now you haven't run into a problem like that you look on the internet has anyone else run into that problem before <laughs> Uh, I read something too about the uh, the DOS version of this game. There was some uh, technical problems with the 640k barrier. Oh, it, no! The only problem I remember having was I think we wrote this for the 486 CPU. 286? No, 286. 286. 286 is where everywhere 8086 had pretty much disappeared. The 386 hadn't appeared yet. This is the um, Intel chip. There was a bug in the 286 chip. 
at the very low level CPU level. And we wrote, we didn't, we, we didn't realize this bug was there. We took it, basically we took advantage of the bug to scroll the screen, to scroll it smoothly and so on. When the 386 came out, the program wouldn't run anymore because Intel fixed the bug in the 386. Well, so for you, so, literally, this bug not, was a feature for you. <laughs> yes. So we had to re completely redesign our scrolling code because it was low-level stuff even then just to get it to scroll smoothly because computers are still slow then. So I guess you had to rewrite the, <laughs> yeah. re-release it or something. Must have been kind of a mess with people sending it. Yeah, and of course you just had to mail them a disk, right? They, if they bought it and didn't work yeah. on it. Mm -hmm. Well, in Empire Two, uh, which I have a copy of here, <laughs> nice big box on that. And so I guess by this point you've been working with New World Computing. I think were you working with them back at the Perfect General as well? Um, no. So this, this was the would, first. Uh, this would have been our first thing with New World. So how well did you get to know those guys over there? Did you meet uh, John Van Kanningham and, and company? Oh, yeah. We got to know them fairly well. I liked working with New World. They were a good bunch of people. Yeah, it's a nice compliment, too, I suppose, to their, like, I guess they did the Heroes series later on. Yeah. Which, mm -hmm. You know, I thought that sort of had a vague uh, Empire-like feel to it. <laughs> I guess maybe they were inspired. Uh, so one thing that's cool about Empire 2 is uh, that this scenario editor for this one, you you can not only make your own maps, right, but you can make your own custom units. So apparently people have made uh, prehistoric versions of the game and ones with the sci science fiction battles and all that stuff. You ever see any of those? Or uh, Was that the idea uh, that people would be allowed to do that sort of stuff? Well, the whole, my what I was trying to accomplish with Empire 2 was basically create a war game construction set. So, uh, but one that was accessible to anyone to fiddle with, which meant I needed to keep a clean set of rules, which would work over a widespread of how technology changed in warfare, but still somehow get it to model everything from phalanxes battling each other to modern tanks battling each other and everything in between. Uh, yet still keep a clean enough set of rules that they're concise, they work together, and so on. So there was a large design issue with that. How do I invent a rule which applies both to a phalanx and a tank, and so on? Um, I think it went well. I don't think it went great. But I liked the experiment of what I was trying to do with Empire 2. There's quite a bit more to it. Uh, the units take damage in this one, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there's morale issues, uh, weather factors. I mean, it sounds a lot, sounds significantly more complex than the, uh, for the first game. But I was still trying to get it as simple as I could within mm -hmm. that context. Okay, well, let's see, just about, just a few last uh, questions here. Let's see, I think I've kind of already covered this one, but uh, maybe we could just see what, what you come up with for it. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, with the Empire series, you know, I mentioned that's a lot of, plenty of people still playing it today. Yeah, sure, the graphics might not look modern, but, you know, the gameplay endures. Uh, do you think that modern games are just too much focus on graphics, not enough on rules and solid gameplay? I wouldn't go that far. I ha would say I've seen a lot of weaknesses in gameplay versus graphics or whatever. Uh, one thing, though, I'm noticing, that to me, this problem was greater 10, 15 years ago, when each new game had to beat the last one graphically. These days, graphics have been taken to such a scale that you can't do a major improvement in graphics. You can do fine changes or whatever, which has forced game designers and so on to go back to the actual the gameplay and entertainment value. So that push of graphics is not as powerful as it used to be. 
and therefore we're seeing much better gameplay these days. That's a nice, a nice perspective. I like that. The graphics get so good that they don't. That's not even really a factor anymore. <laughs> yeah, I have to start worrying about the game again. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, is there anything else that you wanted to say about Empire, or the legacy of this game, or you know, do your students play it? I assume they. Yes, <laughs> well, most uh, of my students have never heard. Never of heard. It. Oh my god. <laughs> You're kidding, right? It's too old for them. They weren't even born. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe this uh, new Kickstarter will help it reintroduce it to yeah. them. Mm-hmm. I, I, like I said before, I like seeing it still there. Well, just to wrap up, you told me a fun story over email that I thought would be a, a nice way to end the uh, in the interview. So you were talking about this train, ancient, no, not ancient, <laughs> but historic uh, train wreck, and uh, they were having some some problems finding the site, right, based on the photographs, and you managed to come up with a pretty clever solution for this. Thought it'd be, I want to hear you tell that story. Okay, well, again, I'm a computer nerd. I'm also a railroad buff. Uh, when trains, the software, came out, what, 15 years ago, something like that, Uh, I started playing that and building virtual model trains inside my computer, which was cool. At the same time, I'm about 20 miles from uh, the source of the gold rush here in Colorado, which was uh, near Blackhawk, Colorado. You've done some of that yourself, too, with the gold panning. No, I've never done the gold panning. Never done the gold? You've explored the... Mm -hmm. And I had gotten a little bit interested in the railroad, which was near here and so on. And I had gone up to the museum in Central City and they hit me over the head. And I ended up doing a lot of work for the museum, doing various research and so on. And I had never even there was a couple railroads up there. There was this three foot gauge uh, railroad, which went from Denver on up to uh, Black Hawk to handle all the ore coming in and out. It was originally the Colorado Central, then became the Colorado and Southern and so on. This is all interesting stuff. But there was another railroad up there, which basically went from the mills, which were in Blackhawk, up to the mines themselves. And this was a two-foot gauge railroad, which ran shays, for those who know what a shay is. And um, it had about 26 miles of railroad track and so on. And it was It was a very finite railroad. I mean, it was only 26 miles of track. And I got it into my head that I would model the whole railroad in the computer on a one-to-one scale. And I built, I mean, I brought in USGS uh, data so I could have my train properly. And I found other maps and I found photos and everything else. And I was able to build a fairly reasonable model of the whole area. Uh, I had friends. I wasn't building the uh, structures myself. I had other friends contributing, building me the 3D models, out 3D Max and so on, of the various structures of the various mills and mines. So I had a fairly detailed map of this whole area, so 100 square miles or whatever. And I came across um, some pictures of a railroad wreck that no one quite knew where it was. It was obviously from the Gilpin Tram, but where on this 26 miles of track, which wound its way all through the mountains and so on, was this? What I ended up doing was I went back to my model and started walking down the trackage, comparing the scene I was seeing in my 3D model to the photo. By doing that, I was able to find the exact location of where the accident was because I could, could basically set my camera looking the same way as the photo was. I could see all the mountain lines. I could see where the track was and so on. And we were able to identify exactly where that accident was based on using the 3D model of the area. <laughs> that's so that's right. the yeah, that's awesome. So what did they go out there and find some stuff or what was the... Um, no, there was anything left. The roadbed's still there to some extent, but and you can actually let me plug this. If you're interested in this, you can see a little bit more information on this on my website, gilpintram.com. 
G I L P I N T R A M dot com. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks, Mark. It's been really fun talking to you. Uh, do you have any uh, parting words of wisdom as a uh, the aspiring game designers that might be watching this uh, strategy bunny? Uh, good strategy tips or <laughs> any uh, quotations? If, if you want to be a game designer, you need to understand the mechanics of games. It's not something simple. It's something complex because you're taking a lot of little pieces that come together in such a way that you can tell a story. That is a story which is created between you as the game designer and the game player. You're not telling the story yourself. You're telling the story with the game player. And each time that game is played, a new unique story is created. So that's my last words. (laughs) <laughs> that's beautiful <laughs> I love that uh, last words hopefully do not <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway thanks again Mark a lot of fun uh, thanks for all these uh, great games uh, like I say we gr- I grew up playing these and still like to boot them up every now and then and, my and, pleasure you know, see what I can do so uh, hats off to you hope you have a great rest of your day well thank you That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week, uh, probably doing a retrospective or maybe a review. Not quite sure what I'm covering yet. I'm actually having some issues getting a copy of Grimoire, so if you happen to have an extra key for that and you want to see that one, uh, you can go ahead and send that to me. I actually purchased it on uh, Indiegogo back in the day, and I I don't want to pay for another copy of that game. So uh, Anyway, just letting you know what's going on with that. I might end up covering something else instead. Uh, We'll see, but hopefully you guys will enjoy it. Uh, As always, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you very, very much for your support of this show. Uh, It really means a lot to me, guys. You're keeping it on the air. Uh, So if you like these interviews, uh, you like the reviews, retrospectives, maybe you just like me. (laughs) I just head over to that Patreon link in the uh, show notes, and you can become a Ratreon, and you'll uh, really get more out of the show, I think. Uh... Plus, there's some cool perks I'll tell you about in a minute. But I wanted to welcome some new Ratrions, Ois and Timo. And I don't know if I caught these other guys uh, last time or not, so I'll just repeat it uh, just in case I didn't. Patrick, Roberto, and Grigory, welcome to the Rat Pack. All right, uh, what about that news from the Mat Cave? So first up here, a couple items from good old Stig. Uh, He wrote in about this game, Tiny Thor. Become a hero and slip into the role of the legendary thunder god Thor. Destroy enemies with your hammer, collect coins, jewels, solve puzzles, switch puzzles, (laughs) and uh, big worlds. Uh, This is coming out in the fourth quarter, 2017. It's from Asylum Square out of Germany. And the music, uh, it's got a wonderful soundtrack to it uh, by Chris Holzbeck, who, of course, did the music for Turrican. One of my all-time favorite soundtracks uh, for a game. Uh, he also wrote in about this little video, a little playthrough video. Uh, somebody has done Ultima Underworld in Unity, a guy named uh, Sir Babu Fat. Uh, it looks really impressive. Uh, it looks pretty smooth. I guess there's still a few problems with this. Not sure what's going on, if he's going to eventually uh, release this officially <laughs> or anything else, but I just thought I'd post it for your curiosity. It uh, looks pretty neat. Now, this is one I'm really excited about. As you know, I'm a huge uh, Legend of Grimrock fan. Love the, both, uh, both Grimrocks. I love that kind of game. <laughs> Going back to uh, the original Dungeon Master, even. Uh, we have a new, uh, new one out, new grid-based uh, game in that style coming out called Vaporum. This one's got a steampunk theme, and it is from uh, Fat Boy Games out of Slovakia. Uh, so take a look at this thing. It's got, uh, of course, first-person real-time combat, puzzles, gadgets... Uh, Lots of exploration, loot character, customization, a mysterious storyline, fully voiced main characters, and of course the steampunk setting. Anyway, this looks really impressive to me. I'm really looking forward to uh, playing it. And apparently it will be released on September 28th. So something to look forward to. Just a huge fan of this uh, genre of games. So uh, hopefully this will be a good one. Vaporum. All right, so what about that ale of the week? 
Uh, well, this week I've got a uh, apple cider, a spiced apple cider, a sparkling uh, beverage from the uh, Reeds Company. These guys do a lot of Jamaican uh, ginger ales and ginger beers, that sort of thing. Uh, I just happened to notice this one, though, a spiced apple brew. Kind of looked interesting to me. It says it's a uh, uh, Reeds Spiced Apple Brew is another one of our delicious brewed soda revivals. Each batch, handcrafted, yada yada, uh, apple juice, <laughs> ginger root, cinnamon, and other mold cider spices. Sophisticated, sparkling, spiced apple cider. So it all sounds uh, good to me. Uh, eight grams fresh ginger per bottle. So I had it upside down uh, so the uh, ginger could collect, I suppose. It's supposed to have a strong ginger bite and 50% uh, fruit juice. So I'm kind of excited about these. You know, I'm a huge fan of the craft brew uh, beer scene. It's uh, nice to see that they're uh, also doing the same sort of things with sodas these days. Uh, so I won't run out of cool crafty beverages anytime soon. But anyway, let's get this one open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this uh, spiced apple brew from Reed's, who, uh, by the way, apparently are based in Los Angeles, uh, California. Ah, this really smells nice. You... You smell the apple in there, but it, you're, I think they really sort of nailed that, those mold spices that you get with a good apple cider. Maybe you had a mold wine uh, before. Uh, that's always a treat. Kind of a cinnamon uh, with some other seasonings in there, some other spices, I guess I should say. I'm not really familiar with all of them. All I can say is that you definitely smell the apple, a little bit of a peach, and then uh, some kind of herbs <laughs> uh, going on there. But anyway, it smells really, really nice. Uh, let me give it a taste here. Wow, this is just... Wow. <laughs> they, uh, this is uh, actually quite delicious. You get that a really strong apple taste, and then you taste those uh, molds, uh, mold spices right after it. Uh, really smooth, but uh, kind of a creamy consistency I like. Uh, it's very active uh, in the mouth. I'll try it again here. Yeah, you, you, there's a lot going on. I guess there's some ginger in there, but I'm really sort of tasting a, sort of a peachy taste in there somehow. Uh, but it's all really good. It's uh, sweet, but not too sweet. I like the uh, complexity of those uh, mold spices uh, quite a lot, actually. And it's got about the same uh, consistency and a sort of head that you'd find on a beer. <laughs> so if you're looking for uh, alternatives, this is a, quite a nice one. I'll try it one more time here. Yeah, this is just a really exceptional, exceptional beverage. Uh, I really love this. You know, a lot of these apple cider beverages you get, they're so sugary sweet, it's kind of a turnoff, right? Uh, this one, it's just sweet enough, and you get all kinds of uh, interesting stuff going on with the spices, and I guess in the ginger they put in here. And just a, a really, really, now I could drink this all day, really. Uh, so I'm going to go a full five out of five uh, drinking horns on this. Uh, spiced Apple Brew by Reed's. If you, if you find a bottle of this, you should probably pick it up. Uh, all right, so let's uh, wrap it up with a quote. And I was looking uh, for quotes about trains. Uh, Mark seemed to be uh, a big fan of trains, right? So uh, I don't think you're going to beat this quotation. It's from Dwight D. Eisenhower. <laughs> I'm sure Mark knows all about him too, right? But anyway, the quote goes something like this. Neither a wise man nor a brave man lies down on the tracks of history to wait for the train of the future to run over him. Hope you guys enjoyed that and see you next week.
Why must you needlessly complicate everything?